Did Christ descend into hell? This is a question that confuses many people. How can it be that the second person of the Most Holy Trinity, the Eternal Logos, the Good Shepherd, would descend into hell? If you recite the Apostles' Creed, there's a line in there that Christ descended into hell. And there's a number of passages in the New Testament that talk about Christ going into the inner part of the world or even going and preaching to the spirits that are in prison. So today, we're going to go step by step. We're going to look at what the New Testament says about Christ's descent into the inferno, into the hell. We're going to look at the four sections of hell. There are four sections of hell. A lot of people don't understand this, and this is what leads to confusion and to error and to heresy. So, St. Thomas Aquinas is going to be our guide today through the four regions of the underworld, the four regions of Hades, of hell. Then we're going to look at why it is that Christ had to descend into Hades and what it is that he did there for Adam, Eve, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Moses, Ruth, King David, Isaiah, all these Old Testament faithful. And then I'm also going to end and talk about the liturgy, particularly the liturgy on Holy Saturday and how it was changed in the 1950s. Holy Week liturgy was changed 1955, moving into 1956. And then, of course, that led to the Novus Ordo in 1970. And there's some important distinctions in the old, old liturgy of pre-1955 that were lost thereafter. I'm going to explain to you why those matter in light of all this theology and all this tradition. If I have time, I'll read from an early Christian document um, about the harrowing of hell, the harrowing of hell by Christ our Lord. Now, before we get going on this, we will begin with a prayer. I invite you to pray the Our Father. Oremus. In nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui es in Celi, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra, panum nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos a malo. Amen. Nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, let's get started on this question. Did Christ descend into hell? Before we do, though, please give me an Easter gift of sharing this video. Now, if you're on a phone or mobile device, you'll have to actually X out of the live chat if you're watching live and hit the share button. It's underneath this video. If you're on a computer, you can see it right there. So share it on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Gab, Parler, all your social media. And please also, while you're there, give it the thumbs up. Please give me a like on this. And if you're new and you want to get live videos on these topics, theology, scripture, history, please subscribe. You can also see that underneath this video. Uh, also, perhaps you can see it in the bottom right and hit that bell. That'll notify you every time I go live. If you're on a mobile device or a phone, make sure you turn notifications on. All right, let's look at a little scripture here. I wrote an article uh, many years ago now looking at this topic of Christ's descent into hell. As we say in the Apostles' Creed, he descended into hell. Now, there's two errors right off the bat that we need to dismiss as heretical. The first is that Christ descended into the demonic hell the hell of punishment, the hell of the damned. This is heresy. It is taught by John Calvin, the Protestant. It must be rejected. Calvin wrongly believes 
that Christ has to experience, in order for us to be saved, Christ has to experience damnation, and therefore he goes to the hell of the damned. This is not what Catholics believe. It's not what Eastern Orthodox believe. It's not historical Christianity. Reject it. If you believe it today, renounce it. The other error made by, and by the way, uh, Hansers von Balthasar, a Catholic, so-called Catholic, teaches this error that Christ had solidarity with the damned in Gehenna and the hell of the damned. This is heresy. This is why I'm always saying stay away, away from Balthazar. Balthazarian theology, which is promoted by Bishop Barron, is erroneous. Do not follow it. You will fall into heresy and you'll be deceived. The second error is that Christ didn't descend into hell at all. The problem with this is we believe that Christ is fully God and fully man. We also believe that Christ has a rational soul. Some heretics believe that Christ doesn't have a soul, that his divinity replaces the soul in the body. This is not Catholic teaching. This is not what the Eastern Orthodox hold. It's not historical. It's heretical. The Orthodox Catholic teaching is that Christ has a body from the Immaculate womb of the Virgin Mary. He also has a human soul, and his humanity, body and soul, is united to his divinity. This is why I say body, blood, soul, and divinity. So if Christ has a soul and he died on the cross at 3 p.m. on Good Friday, the soul did not stop existing. The soul of Christ still existed. It was united to his divinity. It was his deified soul. And that soul was working, was operating from Good Friday until the resurrection on the third day on Sunday. And now we enter into the mystery of what was the soul of Christ separated from the body on Good Friday. What was this pure soul of Christ doing in his ministry as high priest? And the answer is, he descended into hell. Now, here's a few Bible verses. St. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9, let me put it on the screen for you. Here we go. Make it nice and big. St. Paul. Christ our Lord descended into hell after he offered his life on the cross. Now that he ascended, what is it but because he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? So Paul's teaching here that there was a descent into the lower parts of the earth, not just placed in a grave, but that he went into hell. St. Peter in Acts 2.24 says, quote, God hath raised up Christ, having loosed the sorrows of hell, as it was impossible that he should be holden by it. So here we see that Christ conquers, has victory over hell. Also, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19, Christ coming in spirit preached to those spirits that were in prison, which had sometime been incredulous. And St. Athanasius, the great defender of the Trinity, of Christ's divinity, he says, Christ's body was laid in the sepulcher when he went to preach to those spirits who were in bondage, as Peter said. So I'll put this on the screen for you too. Because it's important that you realize that the Bible, but also the church fathers, are teaching this pure doctrine. So here it is. All right. Christ coming in spirit preached to those spirits that were in prison that had sometime been incredulous. So this happened between Good Friday and Holy Saturday. We also read prophecies of this in the Old Testament. For example, the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah 9.11. Thou also by the blood of thy testament hast sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit. This is talking about Christ delivering the Old Testament saints, Adam, Eve, Seth, Abel, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, goes on and on. They were waiting below. Now, this raises the question, 
Why were they waiting below? What What's going on with this? All right. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned and they were kicked out of the garden? And then there was an angel with a sword, like a lightsaber. That's what my kids say. Dad, that was a lightsaber. Yeah, I guess it was the first lightsaber. A sword of lightning guarding the entrance to the Garden of Eden. Humanity was kicked out of God's presence, kicked out of paradise. Now, at the time of Moses, God instructed that the people of Israel create a tabernacle, which later is constructed as the uh, temple in Jerusalem. And the tabernacle in the temple was a mock-up, was a model of the Garden of Eden. It had uh, fruit, trees, blossoms, and on the veil, separating people from the Holy of Holies, God's presence where the Ark of the Covenant was, was a veil with cherubim on it, reminding them that cherubim were blocking off their entrance into God's presence. When Christ died on the cross on Good Friday, we read that the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. That means God tore it. And he said, you are now allowed back into the Holy of Holies, into the garden. Why? Because the Son of God, the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, by dying on the cross and shedding his blood as the Passover lamb, He opened the kingdom of heaven back up to people. Before that very instant, the people of the Old Testament had to go to what the Bible calls in Hebrew, Sheol. Sheol. S-H-E-O-L. Sheol. Sheol is the underworld. Now, the underworld, as I've mentioned already, is divided into four parts and this is based on sacred scripture first off when we think of hell we think of the word we think of the place called gehenna or jehenna also called hell of the damned or demonic hell this is the fires of hell if you go to jehenna this is where all where satan and the demons are going and where the damned go like judas iscariot you never get out It's not purgatory. It's not temporary. Gehenna is forever. It's where damned people go for eternity upon eternity upon eternity. And it's where Satan and all the evil angels, the demons, are going to go. That's the lowest part of hell. Gehenna, the fires of hell, demonic hell. Sometimes also called Tartarus. All right? Now, There are three other sections of the underworld of Hades that are not eternal damnation. This surprises some people. If you're a Protestant, you probably never heard this, but this is Catholic teaching. And St. Thomas Aquinas teaches that there are four abodes, four levels of hell. Now, I've done a whole YouTube video on this on my channel here at the Dr. Taylor Marshall Podcast. I encourage you to look up four levels or four sections of hell video here on the channel. It'll break it down for you more than I am right now because I've already done it. But basically what Thomas Aquinas teaches is that there is a section that is below the world, that is near or proximate to where the damn people are, but is actually a pretty pleasant place to be. And our Lord Jesus Christ teaches us about this in the Gospel of Luke. And I'll put the verse on the screen for you. There we go. This is Luke chapter 16, verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died, this is Lazarus, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died, and he was buried in hell. So if you read this parable in Luke chapter 16, you'll see that our Lord Jesus Christ teaches that both of them go down when they die. This is because Jesus has not died on the cross yet. And Lazarus, the poor man, is in Abraham's bosom. Okay, this is the good part. This is the pleasant part of the underworld. And the rich man goes into Gehenna the flames of hell. And he's in torment and it shows him in fire and he wants just one drop of water. 
But Abraham and Lazarus cannot give him a drop of water. They cannot give him anything from paradise in the underworld because they are separated by a great chasm. Now, in Catholic tradition, this nice part of the underworld, the nice part of hell, has a number of names. We call it Sheol. Sometimes it's called paradise. Sometimes it's called Abraham's bosom because that's what Christ himself actually calls it, Abraham's bosom. And it's also called limbo or limbus in Latin, limbo of the fathers, limbo of the patriarchs. What does limbo mean? Limbo comes from Latin limbus and it means edge, hem, like the hem of a skirt or of your shirt. Limbus, you can think of a limb on a tree. What is a limb? A limb goes out from the tree, away from the tree, a limbus. So that's what limbo is. So limbus, the reason it's called limbo or limbus is because there's a section of hell that goes away out from the fires of hell. The fires of hell is where the demons and the damned are. There's an outer edge, a limb, where the Old Testament saints used to live in a comfortable and good place. This is called limbo of the patriarchs, limbo of the fathers. All right, now what about the other two sections? Well, we know from reading 2 Maccabees and from the tradition of the church that there's also a place that's fiery, that's punishment, but it's not for eternity. It's not forever. It's temporary to purify us from our attachments to sin. And we call this place purgatory. That's also in the underworld. And people in the Old Testament went there to be purified. That's why we read about it in 2 Maccabees. This is why Jews today pray for the dead. It's why we Catholics pray for the dead. And you spend however much time you need in purgatory. And then nowadays you would go to heaven in the beatific vision. In the Old Testament, you would graduate from purgatory into limbo of the fathers. So, so far we have three sections to hell. Gehenna, Gehenna, which is the fiery hell of the demons and the damned. We have limbo of the fathers, where the Old Testament saints went, and they were emptied out when Christ ascended on uh, between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, the resurrection. We have purgatory. And then also traditionally, we have the doctrine of limbo of the babies, limbo of the children. This is the teaching that unbaptized babies should not be punished. They did not do any sins. They are innocent with regard to actual personal sins. However, they were born outside the garden. They were not born inside paradise. They were born outside paradise. And therefore, since they don't have sanctifying grace, they cannot... I mean, it's a metaphysical impossible possibility unless God intervenes. Please hear me say, unless God intervenes. It's impossible that they could enter the beatific vision, but they should also not be punished. And so traditionally in Catholic theology, there was also understood to be a limbo, a limb, away from the fires of hell that was pleasant, naturally happy, beautiful, and lovely. So the four sections, you can see them up on the screen now. All right, we got purgatory, limbo of the fathers, limbo of the children, and Gehenna, sometimes pronounced Gehenna. All right, so that's the architecture so far of Hades. Now, what happened on Holy Saturday? The harrowing of hell. Harrowing is like the harvest. Christ comes as victor over hell. He does not suffer in the fires of hell. He comes in procession with his angels to be a victor. That's why I like this picture so much. It kind of shows Christ in his light coming down into the darkness of the abode of hell and saying, I have finally paid the price for you, Adam and Eve. That's what this icon here is all about. It's Christ having descended into hell. Under his feet are the gates of hell, which have been broken down by him. And on his right hand, he has Adam. And on his left hand, he has Eve. And he's pulling them up out of hell and saying, hey, let's get out of here. Let's go to heaven. Let's go to the beatific vision. I've paid the price for you. Now, when Christ descends into hell, 
into Hades, or we might say more accurately, he descends into the limbo of the fathers. He comes as a victor and he's been, it's, the way has been prepared for him. By whom, you might ask? All the Old Testament prophets that prophesied of Christ are saying, hey, he's getting close, he's getting close. When Joseph the patriarch died, he went to limbo of the fathers. And he said, the Messiah is coming. When John the Baptist had his head cut off, just as he had prepared the way on earth, he went down into limbo and he prepared all the people. The Old Testament said, he's coming. I'm telling you, I'm here to preach the coming of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is at hand. And when Christ on the cross said, consumatum est, it is finished. And he gave up the ghost and he died. His soul entered into this underworld, into the limbo of the fathers. Now, I'm going to read for you. Hopefully, I still have it open. This is an apocryphal work, so it's not scripture. It's not the Bible. It comes from the 400s. So it's early, you know, it's church father's material. But again, this is not infallible, and I don't want you to take this as gospel. But this is sort of a, um, a historical fiction recounting written by someone. It's called the Gospel of Nicodemus. It's not technically heretical, but it gives a sort of like a film version, a, a cinematic account of what it must have been like for all the Old Testament saints to be waiting in limbo and then suddenly there's this, this apparition of light and Christ appears to them. All right, so I'm going to listen to you. But just to give you a backup uh, or a backstory, uh, it talks about the Old Testament saints and what they're talking about. And it's interesting, Seth talks about when his dad, Adam, was dying. Adam asked him to go to the garden and ask the angels, ask God, can I just get some oil from, from the tree there to put on my father till I give him last rites? And God says, no, you can't get it. You're outside. So all the prophets are discussing the coming of Christ and John the Baptist discusses the coming of Christ. And then suddenly they are aware that he is about to arrive. And here is the part right here. Okay, while Satan and Hades were thus speaking, there was a great voice like thunder saying, Lift up your gates, O you rulers, and be ye lifted up, you everlasting gates, and the king of glory shall come in. This, is, by the way, is a quote from the Psalms. When hell heard this, he said to Satan, Go forth if you are able and withstand him. Satan therefore went forth to the outside. Then hell says to the demons, Secure well, and strongly the gates of brass and the bars of iron and attend to my bolts and stand in order to see to everything. For if he comes in here, woe will seize us. And the forefathers, having heard this, began all to revile him, saying, All devouring, insatiable, open, that the king of glory may come in. David, the prophet, says, Do you not know, O blind, that I, when living in the world, prophesied this, saying, Lift up your gates, O you rulers, Isaiah then said, I, foreseeing by the Holy Spirit, wrote, The dead shall rise up, and those in their tombs shall be raised, and those in the earth shall rejoice. Where, O death, is your sting? Where, O hell, is your victory? Then came again a voice saying, Lift up the gates, Hades. Hearing the voice a second time answered, as if forsooth he did not know. And he says, Who is this king of glory? And the angels say, The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And immediately with these words, the brazen gates were shattered and the iron bars broke and all the dead who had been bound came out of their prisons and we with them. And the king of glory came in the form of a man and all the dark places of Hades were lightened up. Immediately, hell cried out, We have been conquered. Woe is us. But who are you that you have so much power and might? And what are you who comest here without sin, who art seen to be small and yet of great power, lowly and yet exalted, a slave and yet a master, the soldier and yet a king, and who has power over the dead and the living? You were nailed on the cross and placed in the tomb, and now you are free and have destroyed all our power. 
And you then, the Jesus about whom the chief satrap Satan told us that through cross and death, you are to inherit the whole world. Then the king of glory, Jesus, seized the chief satrap Satan by the head and delivered him to his angels and said, with iron chains, bind his hands and feet and his neck and his mouth. And he delivered him to hell and said, take him and keep him secure until my second coming. And then it goes on and on. But I love the drama here. It's amazing to see hell and Satan and the demons all scared as the gates begin to be shattered and broken apart. Christ descends. And then later he goes to Adam and Eve and all the Old Testament saints and says, I'm your redeemer. I've saved you. Let's get out of here and let's go to heaven. It's awesome. Praise God. That is what the resurrection is all about. Very, very powerful. And this is historically what we Christians, we Catholics, have celebrated on Holy Saturday. You know, Good Friday, we all know, that's the day Christ died on the cross for our sins. Sunday, Easter Sunday, Pascha Sunday, that's the day he rose again. The women come to the tomb and it's empty. Saturday is this quiet, mysterious day when our Lord Jesus Christ is below and his priestly work is below, destroying the gates of hell and raising up Adam, Eve, and all their faithful children from the beginning. Now, if you're able to attend the old Holy Week and the old Holy Saturday, so as it was before 1955, it's making a comeback in all kinds of churches that are doing the traditional Latin Mass, not the 1962 Holy Week, but the pre-1955 Holy Week. If you have a Father Lassant's Missal, which is my favorite Missal, if you have a St. Andrew's Missal, which is my second favorite Missal, you can turn to the Holy Saturday, and it's the longest and most elaborate liturgy of the entire church here, year. Now, unfortunately, Anna Bugnini and a bunch of liberals revised it. They said they restored it, but they didn't. They revised it. And they changed it all up. So in 19, the 1962 Holy Week is the modified, updated version. And then, of course, the Novus Ordo version um, is more updated. But if you want to go back to how Holy Week was celebrated for at least a thousand years, this is it in the Father Lassance. Now, it begins with the fire. And the fire was sparked. It wasn't lit in with, with a lighter. It was sparked, flint and steel. Why? Because Christ sprung from the rocky tomb like a spark. Without even the door opening, he came out. This is why Holy Saturday always began with flint and steel. The fire, which is Christ's power in his life, begins from rock, and it's a spark. That's why you shouldn't use, unless you didn't know, you shouldn't use a lighter or a bick to, write, to light your holy fire. That's not... That's not the symbolism. All right, and then there is a triple candle. Now, this was gotten rid of in the 1956 Easter, but the triple candle has two meanings. First, it's the three Marys who come to the tomb, um, but it's also the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And the light from that Easter fire is, is taken into the church and there's the they say light of Christ three times lumen Christi, and they're lit. They're lit, and this is the manifestation of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then there's the Paschal candle, and that signifies the humanity of Jesus Christ. So the light from the Trinity enlightens the humanity of Christ because the body of Christ is laid in the tomb, and now the body of Christ is raised again. So the, the Paschal candle which is the presence of Christ in his humanity is lit. This is all the symbolism. And then there is a series of 12 Old Testament readings called the 12 Prophecies. And let me tell you, I watched them all this morning. I was watching um, Father Jenkins. He did the pre-55 Holy Saturday. I watched the whole thing. It was awesome. It was glorious. And I went waded through the 12 Old Testament readings, Prophecies. I'm going to do it again tonight. Uh, at our church, but it's, I got to say, it's, it's a little hard. It's tedious. I know Latin. I can follow along in the Latin, even still 
12 Old Testament readings, all prophesying Christ, beautiful and lovely. It's a little bit hard, but let me tell you something. This part of the liturgy, and by the way, in 1956, they dropped it to four readings instead of 12. The reason there was 12 is because the 12 tribes of Israel and 12 represents the Old Testament. The 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob, 12 sons of Israel. And it is long and it is difficult and you got to kind of keep yourself going because it's just reading, prayer, reading, prayer, 12. But it is a reminder that the holy patriarchs and the holy matriarchs were waiting in limbo. That's where we get the phrase late waiting in limbo. They were waiting in limbo. It takes maybe, I'm guessing, around 45 minutes to an hour to read the 12, to chant the 12 prophecies. And you're like, oh, it's an hour. I can't even deal with it. Dude, listen to this. King David was in limbo for a thousand years before Christ came. He was listening to the prophets, the prophecies, for a thousand years before he got to see Jesus Christ. We only have to sit through an hour of reading the prophecies, 12 prophecies, perfect number. Moses, 1,400 years. Abraham, if my numbering is correct, 2,000 years Abraham waited in limbo. In Sheol, waiting for the Messiah. Waiting, waiting. More people joining him, waiting. So this part of the liturgy in Holy Saturday is us joining in the prophecies of the Old Testament prophets, and we join into this waiting. And then as we get to the end of the 12 prophecies, and they're all Old Testament talking about Christ, we get to the blessing of the font. That is the preparation. Remember, baptism unites us to the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what baptism does for us. That's what we read in Romans. It unites us to the death and the resurrection of Christ. So we're united to Christ, and that makes us saved. We're saved in Christ by being born again, not by going back in our mother's room, womb, but by going into the grave of Jesus and coming back out. So after the 12 prophecies, there's the blessing of the font, traditionally also the blessing of the oils in the early church, and then the baptism of new believers. Catechumens come forward. I believe at the time of St. John Chrysostom, when he, I think during an exile, on Holy Saturday, there were, I believe, if I don't, if I can remember correctly, 4,000 catechumens waiting to be baptized in Constantinople. Imagine the throng, the parade of catechumens, 4,000 people lined up to get baptized on Holy Saturday. That's traditional. We need to be baptizing more people because we live in a neo-pagan age, a pagan, a pagan age that needs Jesus Christ. Yes, thanks to all the live admins right now doing great work on Holy Saturday. Then follows the litany of the saints because we celebrate that Christ, he didn't die in vain. The wheat went into the earth and it sprung up and it bore much fruit. That's the saints. See, Christ didn't come just to justify us by imputation. Christ came to justify us by making us actual saints who love God. It's awesome. And then after the litany of the saints, the mass begins. And the first, the epistle is Colossians 3, where it says, Brethren, if you be risen with Christ, seek ye the things that are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. And then the Gospels, Matthew 28, where it says, And in the end of the Sabbath, when it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, Sunday, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and coming rolled back the stone and sat upon it, and his countenance was as lightning and his raiment as snow. Notice, Christ is already gone. Christ left the tomb when it was still sealed. A lot of people don't know that. They didn't have to roll the, tomb, the, 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 the rock out away from the tomb and then Christ walked out. That's not how it happened. The angel comes, rolls away the rock, and it's empty. Christ already 
left the tomb by his resurrection. Powerful, powerful. So that right there is the, the biblical basis for Christ ascended into hell. It is the tradition of the church. I read that passage from the Gospel of Nicodemus. It kind of gives you a dramatic, again, not biblical, right? Not gospel, but it kind of gives you a feeling of how Christians in the 400s, how they were talking about and depicting the descent of Jesus Christ into Hades. My favorite part, if I, if I can read it again, because I know people are just joining us. My favorite part is when hell itself laments that hell is defeated. And he says, and what are you who comest here without sin, who are seem to be small and yet have great power, lowly and yet exalted, a slave and yet the master, the soldier and yet the king, and who has power over the dead and the living. Christ made himself into a servant. He who is God, God the Son, equal to the Father, equal to the Holy Ghost, made himself small in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He was obedient to death on the cross. He gave himself as a complete sacrifice and oblation to the honor of God the Father for our redemption. And by that humility, by that passion, he not only saves us, but brings all the glory of God, all the glory of God into this world, creates saints, which is why we say the litany of the saints. So it's important that we keep, I think, the older Holy Week, the older Saturday with all 12 readings. And we don't change the blessing of the font. We don't divide the litany into two halves. All these things Bunini do. Let's do it the old way. There's a reason it was done the old way. All right, well, y'all have a, a blessed Pascha, a blessed Easter. If I have time, I'll make one more video. I think I'm going to make a video on our Easter eggs and bunnies pagan, and they're not. There's a good reason for it, and talk about some of the fun traditions of Easter. My family's getting excited. The fast is real, I'll tell you that much. The fast is real, but it brings joy, and it unites us to this desolation that uh, John and the apostles felt. Our Lady didn't. Our Lady had faith. Our Lady on Holy Saturday is the only one who had complete faith in the resurrection. Everyone else faltered. Even Mary Magdalene, when she went to the tomb, she said, where have you taken the, him? Even she didn't fully understand. So um, if you like this video, please give me a like. Please give it a like. And please subscribe by hitting the subscribe button beneath the video. And also in the bottom right corner, do it. Hit the bell to be notified. Um, also, I will be doing the drawing for winning the two rosaries by Seraphim Rosaries. These are beautiful heirloom rosaries made of real crystal, real banded garret. These are gorgeous rosaries that are that are they sell for like five hundred and four hundred dollars. They're absolutely gorgeous. I'll be giving those away to everyone who is a Patreon patron supporter. So you can do that. The drawing will be Monday. I said we're going to do it on Easter, but I think with everything going on Easter, it's going to be hard for me to do that drawing. So we'll do the drawing on Easter Monday, the day after Easter. You can go to patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. I've uploaded um, for, for uh, uh, what's it called? Voice Dream, uh, Dom Garen J on Good Friday, on Holy Saturday Liturgy, on Easter. It's all right there. Please go listen to these things if you're a Patreon Patron, you have access to all that. Also, at certain levels, I'll send you books and all kinds of things. So if you want to be in that drawing, make sure you are patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. Let me show you the rosaries real quick. These are seraphim rosaries, and they are absolutely gorgeous. Here is, oh, that's the wrong one. Sometimes I hit the wrong buttons. Here it is. This is the men's rosary. It's gorgeous. And uh, it's in the, the black banded gar uh, garret, I think it's called. And then here's the female one, blue Swarovski crystal. That's not plastic beads, that's crystal. Really gorgeous. Can't wait to give these away. Thanks so much to Seraphim Rosaries um, f for making this possible. If you want to find a really good rosary, like heirloom quality or like a rosary for a wedding or something, Seraphim with a Y. Seraphim makes, I mean, I got couple of them here and you know I'll put one on. There you go.
They're heavy duty. These are two of them. They're awesome. They're gorgeous. So have a holy Saturday. Please, if you don't mind, give me the Easter gift of a Hail Mary. Please pray for me in the work I'm trying to do here on YouTube. And of course, pray the rosary every day. If you don't pray the rosary, you're not on the team. Who was the only, when they placed the dead body of Jesus in the tomb with Joseph of Arimathea, and they rolled the stone, and he, they could not see him. Who was the only person on earth who knew he would be alive and walking around three days later? There was only one person on earth who had 100% faith that he would rise on the third day. And she was completely confident. The Blessed Virgin Mary. She's the only one. The only one. Not John. Not Peter. Not Mary Magdalene. Nobody. Not Joseph Arimathea. They all thought it was over. She knew. How did she know? We know this because of the joyful mysteries. Remember when she lost Jesus for three days and then she found him again on the third day? That taught her the mystery of the resurrection. She knew from that that her, she would find her son again on the third day. This is why we learn this in the gospel of, is it Luke? I think it is Luke. Maybe it's Matthew. We learn it in the gospel. This is why you pray the rosary, because you meditate on these mysteries and you start to connect the mysteries. Oh, it's uh, the rosary's black agate. Ag agate? Agate? My bad. So Our Lady knew. That's why she is the perfect guide to Jesus. She never wavered in her faith or in her devotion, even when she knew that the body of her son was cold and dead in the tomb. She knew that his soul had descended into hell and was continuing to do his work of preaching and of redemption. Pray the rosary every day or not on the team. Read the Bible every day. Have you read the Gospel of John on Holy Week yet? If you haven't, today's a great day. Read the Gospel of John. Again, if you're on Patreon, you can download the file for Gospel of John Dewey Rames translation, and listen to it. Yesterday, when we were driving to Good Friday and back, me and my kids, we listened to the entire Gospel of John using the files that we give you on Patreon. It's a great way to go through the entire Gospel of John while you're driving, while you're working out. It's a great, great, great resource. Please do it today. Get to know Jesus in the Gospels, in the Bible. All right. Remember, friends, our Lord Jesus Christ said, you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Today is the day the light breaks forth. So go out there and be salty. God bless. Godspeed. Happy Easter. Christos Anesti. Christ is risen.